Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension Cooperative Extension, and on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Joe Lauer. He was born in Wasika, Minnesota, and grew up in Staples, Minnesota, and went to St. John's University in Minnesota, and then he went to the University of Minnesota for his PhD. We've established our first theme here. <laughs> then he went to the University of Wyoming for nine years, and in 1994 came here to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and to UW Extension, where he's an Extension corn agronomist. Um, his topic is transgenic crops and cropping systems in the Midwest. We are now finishing the 20th year of transgenic crops, including corn and soybeans, uh, commercially produced in the United States. It's been an interesting two decades. Uh, controversy, productivity, controversy. I'm looking forward to hearing what Joe has to say. Please. Join me in welcoming Professor Joe Lauer to Wednesday night at the lab. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, don't usually do this. Usually what I do is uh, I'm typically uh, more uh, in the field than I am uh, uh, oftentimes teaching in a, in a classroom at the university. But uh, uh, many of the things that I, I'm going to talk about tonight Growers have already heard, so um, uh, nothing's really new for, for them necessarily, but maybe for some of you. I thought what I'd do maybe to start with is just kind of explain what we do, because it kind of sets the background or the context for some of the data that you're going to be seeing uh, tonight uh, as we go through the presentation. One of the things we do, um, my laboratory is not here at the university. My laboratory is really the state of Wisconsin. We uh, conduct trials at anywhere from 13 to 15 locations around the state. Uh, we plant typically about 13,000 plots a year. And right now, this week, we're just starting with uh, the harvest of those plots. Um, uh, we're starting with a silage harvest right now, and uh, that's kind of where we're at. But we really do uh, cover a, a large part of the state in terms of uh, where my crew uh, goes to and, and conducts research. A lot of the things we do have been in the whole area of transgenic evaluation, hybrid evaluation. Uh, we typically will test about 550 hybrids a year, and I figure we get about a third of the, of the hybrids actually sold commercially in the state of Wisconsin. So uh, there's a lot of them that we, that we probably have tested and, and, and growers are now using them, but we typically uh, test about 550. One of the main aspects of what we do as well, besides hybrid evaluation, is the whole area of what we call management of, of corn in various cropping systems. And you'll hear more about some of these experiments a little bit later. And my job, I've got a crew that helps me do all this, of course, uh, but my job is really to uh, do the, the uh, field, uh, field days, uh, the teaching uh, and working with farmers. And, this topic of uh, transgenic crops and corn uh, started in 1994, as was already alluded. This is year 20 of transgenic crops. We really saw the first commercial lines in 1996. So I've kind of grown up with corn and this whole issue uh, really in my, in my time here at the university. And uh, it's been a very uh, interesting and fascinating one, really. So where we're going to go today, um, as mentioned, uh, this is the 20th year. Uh, in corn, there's been about 24 different transgenic uh, uh, trade events that have been released and deployed commercially. Uh, probably the uh, technology that is um, kind of the state of the art right now in corn is what we call smart stacks hybrids. Uh, these hybrids have got eight different traits in them and a total of about 34 different transgenes. And uh, so this is the kind of uh, technology that's out there and that growers have available. What I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit about the yield march in corn because this is a very unique aspect of uh, this particular crop. Um, no other crop really has been experiencing the yield increases that we 
have been seen. And this will set the context for uh, talking about some of the different cropping systems later on. We now have a new world record in corn. It's, I think, 544 bushels is what I, th I think it is, w well over 500 bushels per acre. And um, uh, when I was in school, I, they thought the upper limit of corn production was around 600 bushels. So we're kind of knocking on the door, if you will, um, uh, for some of these uh, uh, production uh, records. That was set in Georgia, by the way, which is not really a Corn Belt state, so it's kind of interesting where it was set. I'm then going to talk a little bit about transgenic crops. I'm not going to get into a lot of the details of individual performance and things, but I do want to talk a little bit about uh, kind of where we're going uh, with transgenic, uh, really all crops. And then I want to finish up with um, just kind of how this fits into what I would just call sustainable cropping systems for the Midwest and some of the work we've been doing. And, uh, and I'll get a little more detail once we hit that point. All right, now many of you have probably seen this uh, uh, slide before. We actually have corn records uh, in the US and for each individual state that goes back to shortly after the Civil War. And up until the 1930s, we really were at, at kind of a uh, plateau. We really didn't see a lot of yield increases, really due to the fact that we grew open pollinated hybrid or varieties of corn. Then in the 1930s, hybrid corn was commercialized, and for the first five years of that whole process, hybrid corn was really, uh, really not enthusiastically embraced by farmers. It took a while for hybrid corn to kind of catch on uh, among the farmers. Consumers weren't really aware of it, but Farmers were, and, and many of them avoided it for a few years. But after about five years, farmers quickly adopted it because they could see the yield benefits with hybrid corn. In 1996, we uh, entered the transgenic era, uh, and that's kind of where we're at right now. But if you look at the yield progress for the United States, up until the 1930s, there was really no progress. Beginning about 1930 to 1995, it was 1.7 bushels per acre per year. And then in, since 1996 in the U.S., it's been about 2.4 bushels per acre per year. And Wisconsin is very similar to this. Uh, keep these numbers in mind here, this uh, 1.4, 1.9 bushel per acre per year. We're going to come back to that in a little bit when we talk about uh, the cropping systems a little bit. But around 2 bushels per acre per year, uh, and Wisconsin fits right in. Uh, in 2007, uh, one of the companies projected that we would, by 2030, have a 300 bushel per acre average. Okay, and to get there, we'd have to have about 6.5 bushels per acre per year progress. Well, you can see that slope there really hasn't gone that, gone that fast, uh, but uh, I think now the new estimate is something like 246 bushels or something. They're adjusting their trend line a little bit. But this year, uh, the first yield estimate that came out in August, we'll see another one tomorrow, but the first yield estimate that came out for Wisconsin was 163 bushels per acre. And uh, if that holds, usually it's a conservative estimate in August, if that holds, it will be a new record for Wisconsin again this year. So we're having a very good corn year. But to get to that, we'd have to really increase the speed of our gain to uh, get to that 300 bushels per acre. I think the significant thing here, though, is that um, nearly every county uh, in the U.S. has significantly increased their corn yields uh, since 1930. But there are large temporal and spatial differences as you move around the country. And that's kind of shown here. Uh, and I'm just showing you the last 20 years or so. So this encompasses a little bit of the years, about 14 years, the transgenic era, if you will. But uh, this, this legend here, uh, anything in red is basically a flat line. In other words, there's no real yield progress. The slope is zero. Uh, as you get to the darker blue, uh, it goes up to three to four bushels per acre per year over the last 20 years. So you can see there's four counties there in Iowa that have been, that are that dark blue. They have gained, on average, about four bushels per acre per year. So over the last 20 years, their yields in those counties have gone up 80 bushels, okay, in, in the last 20 years. But you can see there's a, most of the progress that we've been seeing with corn has really been 
what we'd call the Midwest Corn Belt, Iowa, Illinois, Nebraska, uh, southern Minnesota. Uh, we only have one county in Wisconsin where we've got a three to four bushel per acre uh, e per year yield gain. But as you go out from that, you'll see a lot of counties that where there really hasn't been much yield progress at all. Uh, uh, so um, again, there's a spatial and uh, uh, variability that goes on with the yield progress uh, for corn uh, around the U.S. But again, uh, if you look at some of the some of the better growers uh, in Wisconsin, uh, these these are just some yield results for different yield contests that are that are in Wisconsin from the National Corn Growers Association as well as the Extension PEPS program. But the yield increase has been somewhere between about 3.1 to 4.6 bushels per acre per year among those top growers. So there are a lot of, uh, lot of farmers in, in Wisconsin making very good progress uh, in, terms of their, in terms of their productivity and, and production. Okay, <clears throat> so what I'd like to do now is just switch a little bit to this, uh, this transgenic topic a little bit because this ties into this um, productivity gain. Um, you know, as you go around the countryside, uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a real kind of dichotomy out there as to what transgenic crops mean in terms of, in terms of agriculture in Wisconsin. Some people feel that it's just like motherhood and apple pie kind of a thing. Uh, and there's, like I say, just kind of a, a dichotomy going on. Wisconsin has got a very large uh, number of organic farmers. Um, and that discussion of, of organic production versus the conventional transgenic conduction, uh, production has really been um, very uh, controversial. Um, and uh, I'm not sure why sometimes. Um, I know with organic producers, they can spray all the BT they want. And yet when you put BT into the uh, genetics of the uh, corn plant, that's not acceptable. And uh, there's just a real dichotomy, I think, in terms of uh, some of the practices that are used. We're involved quite a bit with organic production. We have the longest running organic hybrid evaluation program in the country. Uh, but I'm always getting both sides of this argument a lot. And, uh, but it is kind of a grand experiment going on out there, and it's been going on for about 20 years. Now, there are a lot of different sources of uh, GMOs and transgenic traits. Well, we're doing a lot, you know, just with just native gene selection. Um, probably, uh, you know, just uh, one, of the, one of the ones that's uh, really getting a lot of press, especially after 2012 when we had the drought year. That year, there was a lot of interest in what we call water-optimized kinds of hybrids. But these are basically developed with native, regular plant breeding techniques. Uh, they're marketed under the Aquamax or Artesian uh, brand. And there's a lot of effort still in regular native gene selection going on. Uh, we've also had tissue culture selection of hybrids. Uh, basically here primarily with uh, herbicides where you would suspend cells in a, uh, in a uh, test tube with a uh, herbicide in it and any cell that survived would be resistant to uh, the herbicide that you were interested in. A couple of examples were uh, the Clearfield brand or Pursuit and also uh, a herbicide called Post. Legally, the only definition for GMOs is, is something that is basically uh, produced through irradiation or colchicine. Um, uh, that's really the legal definition of what GMOs means. Everything that we're talking about here is really kind of GMOs, but the legal definition only involves uh, irradiation or colchicine. And now, of course, we're getting into the transgenic. And there's a lot of different sources. Uh, basically, with transgenic, what we mean here is that you're taking genes from one species and putting them into another species. We now have also an, another process called cisgenics, where you basically take the, the genetics of the particular crop or plant that you're interested in and shuffle them to get the gene that you want. And a good example of this now has been the uh, uh, anti-browning uh, event in apples and, and potatoes, for example, the acrylamid. But the transgenic one has really been the one that's been the most controversial. 
And there's a lot of different sources of these genes. Uh, uh, for example, the insecticide uses Bt from Bacillus thuringiensis. Bt is a very common soil bacteria uh, that's, that's found throughout the world. Uh, the herbicide glyphosate resistance came from an agrobacterium. Some of these new drought resistant uh, types of hybrids are coming from uh, bacteria, Bacillus subtilis, and actually one comes from an orchid, okay? And uh, again, wherever people find these genes for the different traits that they're interested in, they incorporate that into the, into the corn plant through uh, various transgenic processes. I'm not one that understands all that. Uh, I'm more on the field side of things, uh, but I'm sure there's plenty of people in the room that can, that can help, you know, help explain some of these uh, different techniques, but, but the transgenic one has really been the most controversial one. Now, one of the things that I try to get across to growers is, is that these traits that we are currently using in our hybrids, they don't add to yield. Okay, why would a Roundup Ready trait add to yield? Or why would an insecticide resistant trait add to yield? What they're really doing out there is they're protecting yield, okay? And that's really their purpose, purpose out there. Within a trial, we'll see, we'll typically uh, have 100 hybrids in a trial. We'll see transgenic hybrids at the top of the trial and the bottom of the trial. We'll see conventional hybrids at the top and bottom of the trial as well too, okay? So they're, they're basically what they're doing is they're protecting yield. Now there's a lot of pros about these things. These things work, they work well. Um, and uh, you know, th there is some breakdown of some of the uh, events going on right now, but they do work very well. And really what it's done is kind of disrupted some of the pest cycles. And we used to have a seven year cycle for the European corn borer. We haven't really seen that since 2002. Okay, that's really not a pest anymore uh, out there. Uh, it's eased some of the management challenges that we've got out there, and there's just a tremendous potential uh, with the transgenic crops, and you'll see some of this potential in a little bit. Of course, there are uh, always cons. Um, one of the things, uh, growers have been quick to embrace uh, transgenic crops oftentimes, uh, but there's been a real slow consumer adoption of, of, of the transgenic crops. Uh, farmers oftentimes perceive that all the transgenic hybrids sold out there are very high yielding, when in fact we know they're not. There's a lot of problems with incorporating some of these transgenes. You know, when you got 34 different transgenes in one hybrid, there's got to be some interactions that we don't detect going on out there, and we oftentimes see that. There's always been this yield lag or drag that goes on with some of these crops. I always tell growers to wait about two or three years before they buy some of these some of these hybrids because it just takes that long to really find the best backgrounds to put some of these uh, traits in. And for a while, the yield march that we've experienced kind of uh, stopped, or what I would just say is paused. Uh, there was about 12 years or so where conventional hybrids, or we really didn't see a lot of yield increase going on with the conventional hybrids. I think there was so much effort going into converting a lot of these conventional hybrids to transgenic hybrids, that the resources weren't really there to um, continue to uh, uh, develop, develop the uh, conventional hybrids, keep that yield march going. We're back the last four or five years now, conventional hybrids are yielding the same as transgenic hybrids in conditions where you control weeds and also control the insects. Probably the biggest issue though among growers has been the technology fees associated with with these, uh, with these crops. Typically a bag of corn seed used to cost 125 to maybe $175. Now oftentimes it's around 300 to $350 a bag for seed and there are projections that it could go up as high as four to $500 per bag. So that's been a real uh, controversy and, uh, but again, the technology works. Um, one of the things I should mention too is that Many of these uh, technologies or these transgenes now have gone off patent, okay? It costs about $250 million to get one of these registered, but to maintain the patent is about $5 million a year. And some companies, Monsanto has, has, has agreed to keep the, maintain some of the patents of these transgenes that have been retired, 
A good example is the Mon A10 event, which controls corn borer. That particular event um, uh, was one of the early ones that have come out. It's been retired. It's not really used that much anymore, except by smaller seed companies. And again, it's going to be maintained uh, by uh, Monsanto uh, down the road, for, for a while anyway. All right, so around the world then, uh, we see a lot of um, uh, uh, countries adopting uh, biotech crops. The U.S. is number one. We've got a number of different crops up there. About 70 million uh, uh, hectares are, are uh, planted to biotech crops. Maize, soybean, uh, cotton, canola, sugar beet, alfalfa, papaya, and squash um, have all been basically approved in the U.S. Number two is Brazil. Number three is Argentina. Okay, and they both have about the same number, about 64 uh, million hectares of, uh, of uh, biotech crops. Um, Canada is also a fairly large uh, user of, uh, of uh, biotech crops. And you can see that around the world there are uh, a number of uh, different countries that are using it. Uh, in Europe, um, mostly in the eastern the Czech Republic, Slovakia, those are, are places where they're using some of the uh, biotech crops. France, Germany, and others are not uh, approved yet at this particular point. Uh, one of the things that we see is that this total area uh, for biotechnology, uh, for these biotech crops has been increasing. And uh, over the last few years, now we're seeing more acres in developing countries than we see in developed countries, which uh, I think is kind of interesting. Um, they just uh, crossed the line in about 2011 there. Uh, the, the, the main acreage is really with soybean, uh, basically for uh, Roundup uh, Ready uh, soybean. Uh, that's, that's where most of the uh, crops are, uh, most of the uh, 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 biotech acreage is, is in that particular crop. Corn, though, is also big. Uh, Roundup uh, insecticide and herbicide traits are the really only ones deployed at this point. And cotton and canola are also uh, barely the, kind of the big crops that are, that are used. Uh, most of the uh, traits that are out there are herbicide tolerant. Uh, there are some that are insect resistant only. Uh, again, cotton is a big one there. And then uh, there are some that are stacked, uh, herbicide resistance as well as tolerance as well as insect resistance out there. And uh, again, corn is, is uh, certainly in there as well too. And uh, as far as the, uh, the number of crop, again, most of the acres is uh, really in, in biotech for soybeans. 79% of the acreage is in, is in biotech uh, crops. Cotton is about 70% and maize is about 32% of the acreage is in, in uh, biotech crops. Now this slide here, uh, all of this information you can actually download. There's a website uh, that's, that's available and you can actually sort this data the way you want, but there are uh, organizations keeping track of this. Uh, these are the number of uh, releases that were occurring by year. And uh, it's been pretty steady. It's gone down a little bit over the last few years. Um, but it's been uh, pretty steady. Um, the, uh, the, num the, the, pers the, the company that's really doing most of the releases, of course, is, is Monsanto. Um, Pioneer is also very active, uh, but uh, Monsanto has really been doing most of the, uh, the releases out there. What's kind of interesting, though, is where they're, where they're being tested and where they're being released. Hawaii and Puerto Rico are two major uh, places where uh, these releases are done. Reason is, is because that's where a lot of the seed corn and generation advances are being are done in those in those countries there, or those those uh, states and territories. Of course, Illinois, Iowa uh, is also important, and Wisconsin has quite a bit of activity as well too. Uh, the big Kahuna, if you will, in in, the, in all the crops really is corn. Um, of the uh, I think there's roughly about tw a little over 22,000 different permits that have been out there. 8,000 of them are with corn, and then uh, soybean, and then cotton. But corn really is uh, where most of the activity is, and again, a lot, a lot of it is that you know you can recover a lot of the costs through the seed production process uh, with corn. So cor uh, corn is really um, where most of the activity is. And then as the as the uh, 
as the uh, different traits that are out there. Um, we talk about herbicide tolerance. We talk about insect resistant uh, traits, and those are the two big ones for corn. But there are a lot of other traits as well, too. Uh, for example, nutritionally, uh, with golden rice in, uh, in, in the Far East and vitamin A production uh, to prevent blindness is, is, a, is one that's very uh, 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 pop popularized, I guess. But there's a lot of different things. Um, I think there's probably a lot of nutritional things that we can do. We're seeing this with alfalfa right now, uh, with low lignin alfalfa. That's going to really revolutionize, I think, our dairy industry and the way we produce forages for our dairy industry here in Wisconsin. And again, it's, a, it's basically a nutritional kind of, a, uh, of an event that lowers the lignin uh, in alfalfa. But there are a number of different events. Um, and the agronomic one there, that's kind of the second, second tallest there, that includes things like uh, nitrogen efficiency, uh, drought resistance, uh, those kinds of things uh, uh, in, in that particular category. One of the things that I've always been curious about is where the activity is. I'm going to just go through kind of a, a, a timeline here of, um, of when these things are, are when these different uh, permits are issued and things. Uh, this is 1987, and here's 1988. And then what we'll do is we'll kind of scroll through this a little bit here. But here's 1989, 90. You can see where a lot of the activity is uh, for these different tests that are going on uh, with transgenic crops. Um, and it kind of bounces around a little bit, but, but um, there's a lot of uh, states, and Wisconsin has got uh, quite a few tests every year uh, with, with the different uh, crop transgene, transgenes that are out there. Okay, this is last year in 2014. Uh, one of the things, uh, you know, there's a lot of regulatory issues with this uh, whole area. USDA, of course, is involved. The Environmental Protection Agency is involved as well, too. But also growers and companies have got responsibilities as well. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed in my tenure here, just to get seed sometimes, I've got to almost sign my life away to be able to get and, and work with some of the different uh, transgenes and, and hybrids that are out there. And uh, it's not where I could just go and grab a pound or two of seed and, and put that in our trials anymore. We've got to be very careful and document um, uh, all of this. And, uh, and so the company and the grower basically enter into a uh, contract uh, with, they're only going to grow it that year. Uh, there have been examples of growers trying to save the seed and grow it the next year. Well, that's illegal. You can't do that anymore. And, um, but it was a very common practice at one time. So there are responsibilities all the way down, uh, governmental as well as uh, industry and, and uh, farmer responsibilities. So that kind of brings us to where we're at in Wisconsin here a little bit. And what I do in my job as far as recommending these, these uh, uh, products, increasingly the way we pick our hybrids really kind of dictates the way we manage the crop out there. Um, uh, you know, if you choose Roundup Ready, well, you've got a bunch of options then. You can use Roundup as well as regular traditional corn herbicides out there to control weeds, and we have to use those oftentimes uh, in our production. But that real, that decision is, is becoming more and more important. We always used to recommend using multi-location data and looking at consistency of performance, but we also now have to pay attention to these seed costs. We know that every hybrid uh, has interactions that go on with the different transgenes that are a part of that genetic makeup now. And sometimes we don't know uh, how those interactions are going to manifest themselves. For example, you might have a, whole, a family, one hybrid, but that hybrid might have be a conventional hybrid or another hybrid that's got Roundup Ready trade in it or, the, or a BT corn borer trade in it. Well, each one of those additional traits that are added oftentimes will interact with the underlying genetics of that, of that hybrid, and you don't know how it's going to be expressed. And so what we encourage growers to do is every hybrid's got to stand on its own. Don't buy hybrids based on families. 
And um, the other thing is we, I tell growers to buy the traits you need, although what we're seeing is, is that um, the industry is very reluctant to uh, sometimes tailor uh, transgenes for a grower. For example, in northern Wisconsin, we don't need what's called the corn rootworm trait because we don't have that insect up there. Yet, to buy a transgenic trait, a farmer often at times has to pay for that, for that trait and grow it uh, up in, up in, uh, up in uh, northern Wisconsin. It becomes a logistics issue for getting seed uh, from the, by the seed companies around to different, uh, different parts of the country and things. And so that, that's what uh, that comes in. But uh, some companies are able to do it, and they're able to uh, get uh, uh, hybrids with the traits that farmers need for an area. And uh, again, we encourage that. But again, the bottom line here is that traits don't add to yield. What they do is they protect yield. Um, yes? You've talked a lot about the yield of mm -hmm. Okay. You have not mentioned the quality of the crop. Right. Um, <clears throat> because in corn, quality oftentimes isn't as important. I mean, it's important, um, but oftentimes corn is used primarily as a livestock feed and in the ethanol industry. Okay. And uh, if you've got a light test, the biggest issue with corn oftentimes is test weight. Okay. And if you've got a light test weight type of a corn, oftentimes the, um, th that's not going to affect quality in terms of, of uh, feed value and that sort of a thing. Where the, um, where the uh, quality has a place, though, is in, in some of the mycotoxin uh, issues that we'll oftentimes see uh, in various years. Like this year, we have a big. Uh, mycotoxin issue going on with a wheat crop. Uh, when you have, when, one of the things that you'd oftentimes see with corn is that whenever you have a dry year, you'll get a lot of corn borer tunneling in the plant, and that introduces fungi, which later produce toxins on the kernels that uh, will uh, cause uh, basically abortions in cattle and, and things like that, and that was a quality issue. Well, we just don't have that kind of damage anymore. And so the quality is improved, okay? But in corn, the real issue is the yield, okay? And that's what drives a lot of the decisions here with the traits that are currently deployed, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that, it, that that's not gonna change. Um, there are a lot of quality traits that we can use in corn for various segments of the industry, but right now, that's where we're at with this, with, with transgenic crops. The best example I can give of, of a quality issue is alfalfa, where they have low lignin alfalfa, which uh, allows a grower to, instead of cut, cutting an alfalfa field four to five times a year, now he can produce the same quality forage with only three cuts a year. Every cut is about $150 production costs or so, and uh, he can save himself 150 to 300 dollars in terms of uh, in terms of costs by all, by all, by having fewer harvests out there acre. per acre, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are there are a number of examples of quality issues. Golden rice is a, is probably the uh, blue ribbon example of of um, of uh, a quality issue where we have increased amounts of vitamin A, which um, uh, decreased blindness. Uh, nearly a million people go blind uh, in the Far East because they don't have enough vitamin A. Okay, uh, this has not been deployed yet. It's being held up by um, a number of uh, you know uh, anti-GMO people, and uh, and for various reasons. It used to be there wasn't enough vitamin A. Now there's too much vitamin A uh, in, in golden rice and. But anyway, it's not it's not out there. But that's one a nutritional one that uh, would be very would be very important in that part of the world. But in corn in the U.S., it's really all about yield um, primarily at this point. Okay, so let's switch a little bit now and talk about how these transgenic crops kind of relate to the Midwest cropping system and, uh, and in particular the corn soybean rotation. 
Uh, Wisconsin's very fortunate. We've got the dairy industry here, which allows us to have a more diverse landscape out there uh, for uh, the crops we grow. We grow corn, we grow soybeans, we grow winter wheat, which the straw is probably more valuable than the wheat because we use that for bedding in our dairy industry. And we grow a lot of alfalfa and hay uh, out there. And that has really slowed down at our borders, basically, the problems that, that some of the other uh, states have been experiencing. Uh, one, of the, one of the main ones is, is really the breakdown of the insecticide resistant um, uh, traits that are out there. We now have it in Iowa, Northeast Iowa now, where, where we have the Mon863 event has broken down and we now have corn rootworm that um, basically can live when they eat that particular transient, when, when before they didn't. But it's probably, a, it's probably a reason why it happened. They used that single event for six years on the same field. And um, that's probably why they weren't able to rotate very much. But there have been some, some documented breakdowns of insecticide resistance. The BT technology in general, though, has held up pretty well. There are some, there's some straining on the edges a little bit, and we're starting to see some of that. Uh, but so far, it's held up pretty well. The other big issue is, is in, um, in weed resistance. Um, we've had a number of different weeds that have become resistant, some, many of them per, before uh, the, uh, the advent of transgenics. Uh, but now we're starting to see some giant ragweed, which is resistant to gly glyphosate, coming into Wisconsin. And uh, that's going to be uh, an important uh, issue as we go forward. You know, who's to say some of these resistances wouldn't have developed anyway? Uh, but it's probably being speeded up a little bit with this. We're putting a lot of pressure on Mother Nature, if you will, with these transgenic crops. One of the things that goes on with cropping systems in Wisconsin is, is that it changes all the time. Uh, again, this goes back to 1866. Wisconsin used to be a major producer of wheat in the U.S. A lot of that went away. The uh, wheat uh, uh, bar is right, is right here. Of course, we produce oats and hay to power our farms for a number of years. In the 1940s, once we had tractors come in, a lot of that has gone away except for the dairy industry and, and uh, with alfalfa. But, but corn and soybeans, soybeans primarily, have really become kind of the dominant. It really uh, replaced a lot of the different crops out there in the Wisconsin landscape. And as you go to the Midwest, it's primarily a corn soybean, uh, soybean rotation. And if you look at this rotation, it's becoming tighter and tighter. More of our land is getting into, um, uh, into this corn soybean rotation. You compare 1972 to 1998, and even, even now, uh, we have a lot of counties that have more than 85% of their acreage in the corn soybean rotation and continuous corn. Uh, so it's a very, very tight rotation right now. And again, there's a lot of concern about this because this rotation is relatively young in the scheme of things. It's really only come about in the last 20 to 30 years or so. You look at other rotations or cropping rotations around the world, the wheat barley system of the Mideast mid has been around for a couple thousand years. The rice systems of the uh, Far East have been around for four to 500 years. This corn soybean uh, uh, system is relatively young in, uh, in, in the scheme of things uh, around the world. So there's a lot of concern about the sustainability of this system, and I think we're kind of working our way through it a little bit. Transgenics uh, kind of uh, fall into this a uh, little. Now, Wisconsin, again, is blessed. We got a lot of different uh, crops that we grow by farmers around the state. Well, we're also blessed in the fact that we've got a lot of long-term trials that have been going on for, for many years. Probably the granddaddy of them all is at Lancaster. It was started in 1966. The objectives that those uh, uh, initial scientists started that particular trial with have changed completely, although the rotations are still in place. For example, we're using, we're evaluating greenhouse gas production now well, who would have thought in 1966 we'd be doing that, okay? These have been in place. They're very difficult to maintain oftentimes because institutionally there aren't very easy ways to uh, get funding for these things. 
But the Lancaster trial has been in place for a long time. It's got corn, soybeans, corn, oat, alfalfa in uh, some of these uh, trials as well as wheat. Uh, there's a number of corn soybean trials that have been around um, since 1983, uh, and, and they've been, some of them, uh, you know, 10, 10 to 10 or more years or so. Uh, we've also been trying to add a third crop to this corn soybean rotation, uh, adding wheat in this case here. And these trials have been around since 1984. Uh, we've got a corn alfalfa trial that's, been, that's more recently started, and then there are some other what I would just call system trials that have been in place. Soils had depart Soil science has one that was started in 1958. There's a few others that are out there as well, too. I'm going to talk here about two of these, this Lancaster trial and this corn soybean trial uh, that was started in 1983. And I'm going to present data that, is, that basically includes most of the transgenic uh, time frame here. One of the things we need to kind of get our head around a little bit is just what is this rotation effect that's out there? Uh, this slide here is a kind of a complicated slide, but it's, it's, it's um, once you get used to it, it's not too bad. Along the bottom here, I've got a, a corn and a corn soybean rotation. So this, over the years, this is uh, 20 years of data, 1994 to 2013. And over those years, it's yielded 212 bushels to the acre, okay? Now in this trial, we grow five years of beans on a piece of ground, and then we grow five years of corn. So this would be the first year of corn following those five years of beans. And you can see that the yield is 214 bushels per acre over those 20 years. Basically the same statistically for those two cropping systems. Now when you grow the second year of corn on that piece of ground, yield drops. Okay, it drops about 6%, uh, no, I'm sorry, about 11%, and it's down to about 194 bushels. And if you would grow it a third year on that same piece of ground, you would lose yield again, and you'd be at about 184 bushels. But after that, the yield is basically the same as continuous corn that's been grown since 1983. So that's over 30 years of continuous corn on those plots, okay? So the rotation effect lasts at most two years. You'll see it, you'll see it uh, that first year, and you'll see it the second year, but by the third year of continuous corn, you're basically at yield levels that are very similar to long-term uh, 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 continuous corn. Okay, so that's what we see with corn. Uh, one of the things that we've got in here as well is we've got a conventional tillage versus no-till. No-till is a widely accepted practice for controlling soil erosion. Transgenic crops allow us to do more acres with no-till because we can, we can control weeds with uh, glyphosate. What we see in this trial, though, is that conventional till will typically out-yield no-till in corn, but there is an interaction. Uh, usually we see uh, when we get into lots of residue after years of corn, that's where the conventional till really, really shines. Now, when we look at soybeans, we see basically the same thing, except the story is a little bit different, okay? Here we see soybeans in a corn-soybean rotation. It yields about 56 bushels to the acre. But when we grow that first year of soybeans following five years of corn, we actually see a yield increase over the corn soybean, soybeans in a corn soybean rotation. And this is because we're able to drive down the amount of disease that's in soybeans. Soybeans are very susceptible to soybean cyst nematode and various diseases out there. We're seeing that this year. White mold is really starting to show up in the fields. And, uh, and but, but when you can, con when you can have that, uh, another crop in there, uh, you see a yield increase. So that first year of soybeans following five years of corn is better than soybeans in a corn-soybean rotation. The next year it goes down, and then that third year it's basically at continuous soybean uh, yields, and that's again uh, 30 years of soybeans uh, in, in these plots. So again, the rotation effect lasts at most two years. By the third year, it's gone, okay, in that particular crop. And when we look at the no-till, conventional till, there's really no difference. In fact, our data is showing that no-till is actually better for soybeans than, than conventional till because we control all the weeds 
uh, with the uh, glyphosate resistant soybeans that are out there. Okay, so this is kind of what we're, what we're dealing with uh, with this rotation effect and talking about cropping systems. If you can add a third crop like wheat to this, it improves the yield of all the crops. So uh, when we, here's continuous corn, here's corn and a corn soybean rotation, and here's corn soybean wheat. Yields continue to go up. Okay, the order makes a little bit of difference. The sequence makes a little bit of difference. Same thing with soybeans. As you add wheat to that, yield of soybean, soybeans goes up. And of course, the wheat crop um, uh, is, is pretty high when you've got all three crops in there as well, too. Okay, so that's kind of what we're uh, talking about with the rotation effect. Now what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about this sustainability using this experiment from the Lancaster uh, trial. Again, this was started in 1966. The objective changed quite a bit since that time. But right now, what I'd like to do is, is talk about this whole idea of sustainability. We have a lot of data and things about you know, the economic and social and uh, things that go on. But we have very little data about the sustainability of cropping systems. But this Lancaster trial gives us agronomic data to be able to address that. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk about corn yield. I'm not going to talk about the economics. I'm not going to talk about the environmental things here. I just want to show you what's going on agronomically in terms of production and yield. Now, this trial was, uh, had a number of uh, different rotations initially. Um, I'm going to basically show you these ro uh, rotations here, continuous corn, corn, soybeans, corn, then oats and alfalfa. And then I want to talk a little bit about the corn soybean trial uh, treatment, which was started in 1987. Now, all of these have got different rates of nitrogen as a split plot, but we'll just talk about the rotations here. Now, one of the questions to ask is, what are you looking for when you're talking about sustainability? You know, what, what is it that we're really trying to do with, with uh, measuring sustainability in, in crops? Well. If we look at corn, we know that over time, corn yields have been going up. That was one of the first slides I showed you. Okay, it's been going up about two bushels per acre per year. If you compare that to another system, if those lines are parallel, basically there's really no change in terms of the sustainability of that particular other system. Okay, it's just a step change. It's just a better, more productive system than, than, uh, than the other one. But if you have one that diverges over time, then you basically have a system that's improving and would be theoretically more sustainable. And then you can have the other situation where over time these things converge on one another on the control and they're basically deteriorating. So this is kind of what we're looking for as we evaluate these systems using uh, 50 years of data, basically. Now, here's what that data looks like. Okay, it's real messy. All right, and uh, one of the things that when you look at it by year makes it very difficult. But when we, when we think about rotations, what's our experimental unit? Our experimental unit is that piece of land, that piece of ground. And for, it, for you to evaluate a rotation on that, you've got to put one year corn, next year soybeans, then corn, then oats, then alfalfa. It takes five years for it to basically complete the cycle to look at what actually happened to that piece of ground, okay? So what we, the way we do this analysis is, is we basically are looking at a cycle within this. So for me to get a data point takes five years, okay? It takes five years to complete the cycle when you've got five crops in a rotation. So what is this, well, okay, so remember this, remember these numbers here, 1.9 to 2.4 bushels per acre, two, two bushels per acre per year. And uh, remember, we're talking about Grant County, which is right down in here uh, within the US. Well, let's look at the continuous corn example first. When you have continuous corn and you don't put nitrogen on that for 50 years, yields don't really go up, all right? What's surprising to me is that we still get 50 bushels per acre on average over those 50 years, okay? So there's a lot of nitrogen mineralized from that soil just inherently. Okay, 
So this is eight, eight cycles, 40 years of data. We just finished the ninth cycle uh, last year, and I haven't got that point on here. But when we add 50 pounds to this system, again, we've got a flat line here. Now, we know that corn yields are going up, right? They're going up two bushels per acre per year. Yeah, when you don't add nitrogen to this system, basically, it's a flat line, all right? 50 pounds is a step change. 100 pounds is another step change. We don't start to see improvement until, in continuous corn, we're adding 200 pounds of N to those, to those, uh, to those plots, okay? And that increase is 1.4 bushels per acre per year. Now, when we look at this for rotation, I'm going to look at the first year of corn in this rotation. Right at the start, with zero N, we get 1.8 bushels per acre per year. It's using the nitrogen effect, nitrogen left over from the alfalfa that's grown that last year. Okay, even though we don't add any nitrogen to that system, it's using the alfalfa nitrogen that, that's there, and we see there's 1.8 bushels per acre per year. Okay, when we add 50 pounds, a little bit of a step change, not much, 2.2 bushels, 100 pounds, 200 pounds. Basically, they're sitting right on top of one another here, okay? And when we look at all the different rotations, continuous corn, we saw no real effect until we got the 200 pounds. The complete rotation, 1.8 to 2.4 bushels per acre per year, very similar to what USDA is telling us. And here are what some of the other rotations are showing, up to 3.2 bushels per acre per year uh, with hybrids and things uh, over time uh, with these different rotations. Now, the real question here, though, is what about the corn-soybean rotation? All right, what is going on with that? And remember, remember what we're looking for. Okay, you've seen this one here. This is continuous corn at zero N. Here's continuous corn at 200 pounds of N. These things are diverging, so the, the 200 pounds of N is required, basically, for that to be uh, uh, sustainable, if you will, over time, compared to uh, the zero continuous corn. When you have it in rotation, basically, they kind of sit on each other a little bit. There is a little bit of divergence going on uh, when you add nitrogen to the system. Okay, in this study here, in 1987, soybeans were added, and one of the things that happened right away was that when we added soybeans to the system under zero N, yields went down for corn, okay? In other words, that's a system that is converging on the control or diverging from our traditional ways of producing corn, adding nitrogen, but it's separating over time, okay? And it's, and it's really going downhill. Soybeans add nothing to the corn-soybean rotation. They don't add any soil organic matter, you know, things like that. But when you add nitrogen to the system, okay, it's basically the same as, as uh, things. So you really have to add nitrogen to this system in order for it to be sustainable down the road. And more than likely, over the next 20 to 25 years, this corn-soybean rotation is going to be here probably because we'll probably be able to produce enough nitrogen to, to, uh, to help sustain that over time. But this is some yield data, if you will, about long-term yield data, about the implications of some of these, uh, some of these rotations. And uh, again, this is very difficult to, uh, to get a hold of. All right, so just to kind of summarize here, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, a couple of things about the transgenic uh, things uh, that we've seen. Uh, one of the things that we've seen is that pesticide use has decreased over time. Soil erosion has decreased as well, too, because we're able to do more no-till uh, production and use the Roundup-ready traits for uh, controlling weeds, which was a major limitation in no-till uh, production of corn. We have seen um, uh, a number of different perspectives emerge. You've got the farmer and the industry perspective, but the real the real major one has been the consumer perspective. If you want a good, uh, I think, fair read of what of these different perspectives with well-documented uh, uh, references and things, this report here uh, came out last year, uh, and it's a very good, I think, fair report of the different sides of the issue, again, documented fairly well. Uh, but we certainly have had our struggles with that. 
One of the things to keep in mind here is that there's been no documented effects of GMOs uh, within the food system. Okay, there have been studies published showing some, some lesions on pig stomachs, for example, but those have been retracted, published elsewhere, uh, kind of a thing. But there's been over uh, billions of animal units fed, and there's really been no documented effect of GMOs. And if you want a website of all the research that goes into that, that website is, is right there. It's pages of references. And then finally, this last point, that the corn and soybean system will uh, continue uh, to dominate the Midwest, I think, into the future. Whether that's good or bad, I'm not, I'm not, I think it'd be better to get other crops in it. Wisconsin's a good example of this, that uh, uh, where you can have other crops in it, it kind of slows down some of the effects and pressures from Mother Nature. And uh, again, I think it's a, a good thing to have, but it's probably going to be the main system for, for a number of years yet. Uh, one of the things I just want to kind of come back to, uh, it's kind of an exciting time to be an agronomist, especially when the price of corn is real high. Uh, there's a lot of activity that goes on. Uh, a lot of questions from farmers. It's come back down a little bit, but one of the things that we're seeing right now is that there's uh, just tremendous pressure put on Mother Nature by these transgenics, but it's also changing the way we think about and, and produce crops out there in the landscape. And um, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of, uh, lot of activity, I think, as we incorporate more of these transgenic crops uh, into our cropping systems. If you want to follow what we do, uh, we've got, we do the social media stuff. Uh, we also have a website where when we publish things and make things available to farmers, uh, they can get an email uh, notifying people of that. So if you want to follow some of our, some of our work, you can do that on, on this website. So with that, I'll stop. I know we're short on, a little close to time, but um, maybe I can take one or two questions. That are there. <clears throat> Thank you.